Today we're continuing Howard Goodall's Story of Music, Age of Innovation. Piano. Playing, and this oh, is how it not works. piano. It's what they sound like. Mind blowing, I didn't know that. I can't wrap my head around that this is a thing. Hello everybody, Beethoven says hey. So last week I think we left off right before he started talking about Bach, I believe. I think he got into Vivaldi a little bit. We should be getting into some Bach and maybe some Handel. But before we get into our video reaction today, we are going to do comment time, which is one of my favorite parts of these videos where I go back to our previous video in this series and I take a look at your comments and kind of what you had to say about it. Now, if you don't want to watch this part, there are chapters in this video. You can just click the one for the reaction and go straight there right now and watch that. But for the rest of us, let's have a little discussion about music. Uh, Mike Dowdy says, I would, like others, recommend you watch Howard Goodall's program on the Beatles. He rates them up there with Mozart as one of the most prolific and inventive composers of all time. I have actually heard that comparison quite a lot. For me, it's kind of difficult to have an opinion on it, though, because first of all, I don't really know enough about Mozart or Beethoven to know the details of how exactly they changed music. And I wasn't alive for the Beatles and wasn't really there to experience what sort of change they brought into music at the time. Now, I do love 60s music, so it's not like I'm completely unfamiliar with the music of the time. It's just like the timeline of how things progressed. I don't really have an intuitive sense about that, but absolutely no disrespect to the Beatles. I absolutely love their music. One of my favorite video games used to be the Beatles Rock Band game. The Beatles Rock Band game is actually how I became a fan of the Beatles. I listened to some of their early music growing up because my parents raised us with the music that they they listened to as kids, which was all of like the 60s and 70s stuff. So I listened to that stuff growing up and I'm familiar with it because of that. But it wasn't until I played the Beatles rock band where you were kind of listening to the details of the instrumentation and the composition of the songs and stuff like that to where I realized, wow, this stuff is actually really, really good. So I became a little obsessed with the Beatles for a year or two there and just kind of like all of my spare time was learning about the Beatles. And I've had the good fortune of uh, actually meeting Ringo. I used to work at the Jim Henson and company in LA and there's a recording studio there and he was there a lot recording one of his albums. I got to kind of hang out in the courtyard with him a lot. I wasn't allowed to actually go and approach him and like bother him while he was working but I spent a lot of days with uh, Ringo just hanging out a few feet away from me <laughs> and then one day we actually got to meet and that was pretty cool. Uh, Paul Thomas says old records were played at different speeds. 78s were played at 78 revolutions per minute, 45s to 45 and so on. The introduction of the LP, the long playing records at 33 are RPM allowed up to 30 minutes of music per side. So I'm guessing the faster the record spins, the less music you could put on it. Because doesn't the needle like move closer and closer to the middle as the record spins? Uh, professor Bernard, uh, Professor, are you an actual real professor? Uh, he says that the Great Fire started in a Fariner's in Pudding Lane in Hyde, London. I don't know what a Fariner is, you guys are gonna have to tell me. Air thick with flour is quite explosive, and London medieval houses were wood. Many had thatched roofs and were densely crammed together. The downside was obviously the loss of property, the plus side being that a raging inferno is also good at killing fleas, which spread the bubonic plague, and the death count was frankly astonishing six people. Well, I tell you what, that, that painting that um, we saw in the last video with the uh, fire of London looks like hell on earth, basically, and I am surprised only six people died in that. I guess uh, most people got to escape onto the river Thames. I had somebody tell me that it's not pronounced Thames, it's Thames. I am going to do a video on the Fire of London because I've heard of it before. It seems like it's a pretty famous event that happened, so Wade Fight says, impressed you know these old British songs. Yeah, well, as I just said, you know, my parents raised me with the 60s music and I love it. The Beach Boys are actually my favorite band. I do like them more than the Beatles just because I like the beach sound more. Uh, Neil Beatty says, if you wanted to have a run-through of military music, then look for videos on Trooping of the Color. I have looked at those videos. I just did a search for Trooping of the Color on YouTube and there are a lot of videos that come up showing it. Most of them are like well over an hour long.
long and I don't think I want to do one that long on YouTube. If there's a shorter one that would be good to do, let me know. I don't know enough about it. I don't want to pick the wrong one. If one of you can help me out with that, picking which Trooping of the Color to watch, let me know and we'll try to get to that pretty soon here. Uh, Bernard Kim said, exactly my reaction, which made me appreciate the painting more for Capture so much detail when I visited there. But yeah, I had mentioned that I saw a painting that they brought up in the video last time. It's like Getty or something. Turns out it was a different painting, but it was very similar. But yeah, I, I've i never been one of those people that was like really into art that much, but you really have to like go to a museum and look at the paintings firsthand to really appreciate them, I feel like. If you just look at pictures of them, you're like, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a painting. But when you go and you see how big it is and just all of the fine little details that the artists had to spend time doing, then you really appreciate so much more of the work that goes into that stuff. Alex Bennis says, thanks so much for posting these. It's like learning with a friend. Well, you know what? That is the entire purpose of my channel is because I wanted to learn with all of you guys. So I'm glad that it's also working the other way around. I Be Unreal says, honestly, I'd love to see this two times a week. I wish I had time to do it two times a week, but I don't have the luxury of being a full-time YouTuber, unfortunately. And even if I did, I don't know if I would post videos every single day because I feel like you guys would probably get burned out on that. I like to kind of let my videos breathe for a day or two before posting something new. Probably should post every day just so I could get through everything, all of my requests and stuff a lot faster, but I don't know, I just kind of feel like posting every day would be counterproductive in a lot of ways. Marge Nano Films? I think I butchered your name, but he or she tries to explain the circle of fifths to me right here. I'm not going to read that out here because I think it's a, it's a fairly long comment. Thank you for this comment though. I am going to uh, read through it and maybe it will help me get a better grasp of it. Uh, Pickle Doff says, react to the Sabaton history videos. 100% sure you're gonna love it. Yeah, I've had a lot of requests for that one, so I'm probably gonna have to do that here before too long. Uh, Zafter says here, most peculiar in a good way, seeing my screen name and comment. Well, guess what? You get to do it again. Mendelssohn, that's interesting and unexpected. I mentioned last time that Mendelssohn, I think, would be my favorite composer based on the symphonies I've heard. There was just something about his that was particularly catchy to my ear, but maybe it was just that one. I haven't listened to all of his music, so. Yazik V. Tumain, you have made it into my comment time for a second week in a row. Since the last episode, I've been thinking about your comments regarding Bach, and I think there might be a threshold to enter his music because there's so much going on at the same time. His extensive use of counterpoint with all of those notes playing around at the same time means you have to listen to several melodies simultaneously. Yeah, that's a really, really good way to describe his music. I think your ear just doesn't know what to listen to. The first couple of times I listened to Bach, it honestly just sounded a little bit too chaotic, and again, there was just there was nothing to hook me. It's not quite as catchy, I think, as Beethoven for instance. And then he also tries to explain the circle of fists to me as well. Oh, he also says, I had that question about Louis the 14th because he was like the Sun King or whatever. Uh, according to Yazik, he kind of thought a lot of himself as like a brilliant and luminescent as the sun. I also saw somewhere on here, somebody said that his mother or whatever gave him that nickname and he might not have been crazy like I thought he was, so. Catherine Wilkins says, rather partial to Gilbert and Sullivan's comic opera. Do you like military music and we have music for the armed forces, the RAF, Royal Navy and Army have their own music. Also, Merchant Navy has sea shanties. Yeah, our um, military had, you know, each branch has its own band as well. And they even have albums that you can listen to. Uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, I have a book of Gilbert and Sullivan on my bookshelf, actually. I know Gilbert and Sullivan from Star Trek Insurrection because because Data and Captain Picard sang it in that movie. But that's the only time I've heard Gilbert and Sullivan. Mr. Wolf, do you know Gilbert and Sullivan? No, sir. I have not had a chance to meet all the new crew members since I have been back. The composers, Wolf. From the 19th century. Uh, Shivam Gupta says, Story of music without India, who pioneered the music. You can check out Fix You Cover by Tushar Law. Well, it's kind of a good point, you know, because music obviously exists outside of the West. We are kind of just 
staying in the Western civilization, Western music right now with the classical music, but I think it would be fun though to explore music of other cultures. Well, I know the Beatles did that. You know, George especially was big on like Indian music, I believe, and he incorporated that in some of their songs. Uh, Wade Fight also says that you don't need a classical guitar to play classical tunes. I've mentioned that I might like to get into classical guitar and learn classical guitar. I do have an acoustic guitar, but not a classical one. I do know that you can play classical music on an acoustic, but the strings are like steel on a uh, acoustic guitar. They're not soft like the nylon strings on a classical guitar, but I just got some new strings for my acoustic guitar. I'm probably just going to start learning how to play classical on it because that's what I have. I really like my acoustic guitar. I like the way it looks and stuff. Might as well use it. Speaking of the Beatles, I actually recorded Blackbird of me playing and singing that. I might post that as a video on my channel. It's just the audio though, but maybe I can just like, you know, put a picture of a blackbird up <laughs> or something. Oh, Shane, here you say the Sun King Louis the Fourteenth. It was his mother that coined the phrase. He was a king at four years old, but she used it as a natural example of uh, how the planets orbit of his son in life that translates to the king and his court subjects. Okay, well, I guess both comments can be true then that maybe he thought a lot of himself because his mother basically planted that idea in his his head i suppose all right so i think we're gonna leave it there for the comments again thanks for leaving these on the video uh do the same thing for this one as well it's a lot of fun learning with you honestly i i don't think i would keep up doing this if i didn't have you to do it with or for so i'm really really grateful for all of you for watching these videos even though again like i said we don't get a ton of views on the music videos i really like this kind of niche group that we have on this channel for this stuff so okay so here we are we're going to go into part two of how our good all story of music age of innovation i'm looking forward to learning more about these composers we're going to start off with bach and i think go into handle from there so let's do it take this aria from his saint john passion Zer Fliesa mein Herzer. if we deconstruct its opening instrumental phrase we see that it's a series of exquisite chords with a gently descending bass line That's 15 chord changes in about 10 seconds. But when the voice joins in, Bach's harmonies become even more daring, allowing notes to clash against each other in swiftly moving discords. Here are the dissonances tucked into just the first short vocal phrase. Dissonances may be cleverly disguised, but they're still there because Bach wants to create a feeling subliminally of anguish and grief, which is exactly what the words of this aria are trying to convey. If Bach's aim in his choral music is to move and inspire, in his instrumental music he wants to dazzle. He's the undisputed master of all time of the musical technique of counterpoint, the interweaving of different tunes. and the quintessential Bachian form of counterpoint was the fugue. A fugue, which means flight in Italian, is a complicated form of canon or round. So here's a round that any child in late 17th century London would have known only too well. London's burning, London's burning, ah. fetch the engine, fetch the engine. In a canon or round, the same tune is sung by different groups at different points, allowing each new entry to fit on top of the others. A fugue, 
is essentially a more complicated version, with multiple lines, some coming in backwards or in reverse or upside down. In the United States, maybe over in the UK as well, uh, we would do this with songs like Row, Row, Row Your Boat, for instance. But I didn't know that it was called Counterpoint, so... If this sounds freakishly clever, something Einstein might have done in a physics seminar, well, Bach is the closest thing music has to Einstein, who, by the way, was a massive fan of Bach. Let's look at a fugue by Bach that shows him at his Einstein-like best. First of all, we have the basic theme. It will be too easy just to have this theme repeated and played on top of itself, so Brainbox Bach has it superimposed in a number of other ways. One option is to have it play at double speed and starting on a different note. bad, except that he manages two other tricks at the same time. One of them is to turn it upside down, known in the trade as the inverted version, also at double speed. And another is to play it at half the speed, that is twice as slow as the original. There are four main voices or parts in this fugue, and as it progresses, all of the above techniques cascade over each other, upside down, reversed, speeded up, slowed down, and played at different positions on the keyboard. It Didn't the Beatles do this with some of their stuff too? Like I remember, was it Rain, that song, where they did like some introverted stuff? I think they did that on a few of their songs. I don't know if they got the idea from Bach or not, but... Oh, I also played Rain and Please Please Me from the Beatles on the drums because the drums, you know, I mentioned before that I, you know, played percussion, so I might have to post those videos if I can find them. They're really old and I don't know where they are now. It is a miraculous musical jigsaw. just knows all of this stuff off the top of his head and can just start playing it. Now composing something as complex as this structure you'd think would be hard enough when you've got it all laid out in front of you on the page like a graph. But here's an amazing thing. Bach could improvise fugues like this at the keyboard. From just one fragment of tune, Bach has built an edifice of seven minutes of contrapuntal invention. I mean, when you listen to it, it sounds really complex, but it's actually not because it's just the same tune. Like, he wrote one tune and he's just playing it different ways. Now, I'm not knocking his innovation of the way he arranged all of that together. That is really cool, actually. It's just amazing, like, how, like I said, how complex it sounds, but in actuality, it's one tune that you're listening to. I also didn't know that this was what a fugue meant. I've heard the term fugue a lot, but I don't think I ever really learned what it actually meant, so now I know. Bach's mastery of counterpoint wasn't about solving crossword puzzles or cracking enigmatic codes for the sake of it. He believed what he was doing was the musical embodiment of God's master plan for humankind, a recognition of the intricate mathematical beauty of the natural order as ordained by the Almighty. 
the towering achievements of bach's career are his settings of the trial crucifixion and resurrection of jesus of nazareth This is actually. It's probably Bach's most famous work, and I don't know what it is. At the climax of this monumental opening of the Passion, with two adult oh, choirs and a double sized orchestra already in full sway. He introduces a new, majestically slower tune on top of the entire structure. Like a phalanx of trumpets announcing the arrival of a mighty ruler, it's a children's choir singing a hymn chorale, O Lamb Gottes Unschuldig, O Innocent Lamb of God. In these passions, Bach employs all the techniques we've encountered in this survey of the music of the 17th and early 18th centuries. Vivaldi's concerto style with large and small forces juxtaposed in a musical chiaroscuro. Fugal counterpoint, vast choral effects, musical gravity driving harmonic progressions of which the circle of fifths is but one, dance rhythm patterns and a string-led orchestra made of members of the violin family joining forces with woodwind and brass instruments. I've heard of The Passion, obviously it's a very, very famous work. Didn't know Bach wrote it, honestly. I don't think, I've never been to a live performance of it. I don't think I've ever taken the time to sit down and actually listen to it before. So that would be one that I would have to, I don't know, maybe it'd be cool to find a performance of it on here and watch it sometime. The St. Matthew Passion, well over three hours of it, is a supreme example of how the musical innovations worked out in the preceding hundred years could be brought to bear on a work of epic size and powerful emotion. But there's one other invention made in this period we haven't yet looked at, and it's the most important Piano. appliance of musical science of them all. It could be, in fact, the single most important development in all Western music. It was called Equal Temperament, and this oh, is how it works. <laughs> On a modern, equal-tempered keyboard, I can play in any or all of the available 12 key families to my heart's content. So I can play this... <laughs> ..in the key that Fats Waller played it in the 1930s, E-flat, or in the key of G... <laughs> ..or C... It's disgusting how some people can just like switch up keys like that without even thinking. That's stuff that I have a really, really hard time wrapping my head around. Not even just playing it, just like sitting there and trying to like transpose it or whatever it's called to another key. Just trying to think about it makes my head hurt. Or for that matter, F sharp. Moving from key family to key family like that, the posh name is modulation on one instrument, is what equal temperament made possible. It also made it possible for lots of different instruments to play in tune with each other, which, believe it or not, they couldn't easily do before. So it's worth finding out how this happened. Looking again at our piano layout, we see that if we find the note C, for example, it occurs eight times from bottom to top of the keyboard. We also notice that there are 12 other notes between each of the Cs. This is the thing. As it happens, in Western music, there are in fact at least 19 subdivisions between one C and another, not 12. This is what they sound like. For some instruments, playing all these squashed together notes wasn't an issue. 
cellos, say, are flexible because you can change a note by sliding your finger by tiny degrees along the string. But instruments like the trumpet and piano can't play them because their mechanical valves, buttons, tabs and keys are fixed. It's like the difference between this swanny whistle with its flexible pitch and this recorder with its fixed pitch. What Equal Temperament did was effectively to abolish seven of the 19 subdivisions and create a standardised 12 that would swallow up the other little notes. So what used to... This is so weird to me. I thought for some reason that the piano encapsulated every single note, which I guess according to this it does now. But to think back then that they had more notes than what we have currently, I didn't even think about that. That's so bizarre. It used to be the two separate notes, F sharp and G flat, became one all-purpose note that accommodated both. B sharp, even though it still gets written out in music, got gobbled up as a separate entity by the note C, and so on. So those used to be two separate notes on slightly different pitches? Is that what he's saying? Because I do understand that. Like, I understand the notes and the keyboard layout and stuff. And I understand that, like, B-sharp is the same as C as we know it today. But he's telling me here that that used to not be the case. That B-sharp was maybe a slightly lower pitch than C back in, back in the day. Let me know if I'm not understanding that correctly. But if I am, that's mind-blowing. I didn't know that. In their natural state, the notes of the octave are not evenly spaced. What equal temperament did was to equalize the distance between notes. Thanks to this compromise, oh. you could now jump from chord to chord as often as you liked. The new system of tempering or tuning worked. Indeed, it was J.S. Bach himself who, in around 1722, presented the most conclusive evidence that it worked. He composed two books of pieces to be played in all the new 12 standardized keys, both major and minor. He even called the books the well-tempered clavier or keyboard. I can't wrap my head around that this is a thing. So Bach was writing all of that music with this non-standardized note system? Because if so, that's just like, well, how did, how did that work? What followed Bach's well-tempered clavier were 300 years in which instruments and our ears were calibrated to equal temperament. One reason the traditional music of, say, Indonesia sounds exotic and mysterious to Western ears is because it uses a different system of tuning. Traditional music apart, though, Equal temperament has now been adopted all over the globe. It's hard to exaggerate the importance of the arrival and triumph of equal temperament as a standard across the industrialised world. Like the adoption of the Greenwich Meridian, which made everyone perceive the map and their place in the world differently, equal temperament altered the mindset of everyone who enjoyed music. The modern population of the world now hears all music through the filter some would say distortion, of equal temperament. Hmm. Everyone alive now has a different idea of what sounds in tune or off key to everyone alive in, say, 1600, before equal temperament became the norm. I don't know why this is blowing my mind like this, but it is. I didn't know that this, I had no idea about this, that this was a thing in music. Towards the end of his life, Bach was involved in another new invention that was, in the next century, to be the emperor and empress of the whole piano. world of music. The piano. The piano. What we now call simply the piano was invented in around 1700 by a Florentine instrument builder and restorer called Bartolomeo Cristofori. 
The unique selling point of the new instrument, making it different from all the previous harpsichords, clavichords, spinets and virginals that went before it, was its ability to play soft and loud, or in Italian, piano e il forte. The harpsichord plucked its strings, and so no matter what pressure you exerted on the keys, the notes always came out the same volume. Uh, harpsichords are my least favorite instrument. I think I just don't like the sound. It, to my ears, the harpsichord is really annoying to listen to, and anytime I hear it in music, I just don't even want to listen to the song. I don't know, it's a very harsh sound on my ears. It's not pretty for me personally. I'm sure a lot of you probably love it and love the way it sounds. That's totally fine if you do. I can understand why people might think it sounds really beautiful. Personally, to my ears, I don't like the sound. It's just great to my ears. Christophera's invention, instead of plucking the strings, tapped them with a gentle hammer tipped with deer skin. And the harder you hit the key, the harder the hammer hit the string, resulting poten potentially in different levels of volume for every note. A friend of Bach's, Gottfried Silbermann, began manufacturing pianos. And although Bach played on a few prototypes and even advised on their design, he didn't seem that impressed. Ironically, it was Bach's son, Johann Christian, living in London, who was to become the champion of the new instrument, 30 or so years later. thus paving the way for the young Mozart and others to follow his lead. Thank God for all of these guys that invented the piano. All I gotta say. By the time this early piano piece was written, believe it or not, the music of Johann Christian's father, the great Johann Sebastian Bach, had already started to fall out of favour. For a hundred years after his death, in 1750, Bach was a forgotten, unperformed composer, until Mendelssohn drew attention to his genius in the 19th century. There's my guy Mendelssohn. If Bach had written operas rather than church music, it might have been a different story. Opera composers have always been recorded more respect and fame than church composers. Luckily for his great contemporary Handel, opera was his thing, at least to start with. Handel and Bach were born just 80 miles and four weeks apart in 1685, but never met. Whilst Bach stayed firmly rooted his whole life in his native North Germany, Handel was more the adventurer and entrepreneur. In his long career, he took full advantage of the many technical and stylistic advances in music that swept across Europe in the early 1700s. And there's one other big thing that had changed by 1750. The arrival of you, the audience. And you, we, made a massive difference to the future of music. Before the arrival of a paying public with its own preferences and appetites, music had depended on the whims of cardinals or princes. Now, commercial opera houses and concert halls opened their doors to anyone who had the price of a ticket. It was this new and fickle audience that Handel quickly learnt to serve. Though he spent some of his youth in Italy, Handel wrote most of his masterpieces after moving to London in 1710. <laughs> Handel had two reasons for coming to London. One was that his former boss in Germany had become King George I in 1714. The king and his successor, George II, commissioned music for royal pageants from Handel, including still famous works like Zadok the Priest, the water music, and music for the royal fireworks. 
Handel also settled in London because it was already on its way to becoming the biggest and richest city in Europe. The rapidly rising middle class had money to spend on music, and for a while they were swept up in a Europe-wide craze for Italian opera. The use today of Italian terms like aria, libretto, prima donna and diva began at that time. Handel wrote 39 operas in Italian for the London stage. In London, though, the Italian opera boom was short-lived. Its death knell was sounded by a homegrown work, The Beggar's Opera, produced in 1728. Heard of this. The black musical comedy of Polly Peachum, Jenny Diver and Mac Heath in the underworld of Soho was a full-on parody of the posh folk's mania for Italian opera. It was a huge, long-running success. It didn't do Handel any favours, though. His earnestly serious Italian-style operas now seemed out of sync with the public mood. Casting around for something else to do, he found an unlikely, unwitting ally in the shape of the Pope. As well as banning women from singing in church, the Vatican in the early 17th century had from time to time forbidden opera, which the Pope thought was too damned rude. The result was the rise of the oratorio, a kind of opera that didn't have costumes, or women, or lewd plots, or comedy, or scenery. The singers didn't have to act anything out, they just stood there and sang. Oratorios were originally performed in church, and they drew their subject matter from the Old Testament and no one could object to that. So when Handel's luck with opera ran out, he turned to English language oratorio instead. It was an inspired move. <laughs> Handel's first ever oratorio in English, Esther, was performed in 1732. It was put on not in a church, but in a West End theatre. Handel wrote 16 more oratorios, nearly all based on stories from the Old Testament, all seen in theatres. In these works, Handel took elements from Italian operas, oratorios and concertos, added in Lutheran church music style and grafted them on to the local English choral tradition aiming to seduce an audience eager for musical excitement. He succeeded triumphantly. Alleluia. chorus is really fun to sing. I've been in choirs where we sang this before. It's always fun to like learn your part in this because there's four different really distinct parts. It sounds hard but it's actually not very hard to learn. <laughs> Handel brilliantly brought together, in a wholly accessible way, all the musical idioms of the previous 50 years. Dramatic and stirring choruses, full-on crowd-pleasers, moving and tuneful solos borrowed from a style that opera had made popular, and an orchestral bedrock owing a debt of gratitude, once again, to Vivaldi. <laughs> What's more, Handel's oratorios were richly allegorical stories with plenty of emotional impact, but without the need for histrionic overacting to embarrass the English. And what an and then the English invented the pantomime, right? The audience thought was now important. Handel's oratorios, though based on religious stories, were essentially commercial productions mounted in theatres, not churches, aimed at a paying public. Unlike the St Matthew or St John Passions of Bach, 
which were aimed at a congregation who would have attended church anyway, Handel was trying deliberately to court public taste, which he did with bells on. So could you say maybe that Handel was like the first major pop artist? There was one other key and topical element in Handel's close relationship with his audience, patriotism. His 45 years in London coincided with Britain's rise to the status of world power, and her growing wealth and military success found their celebration in Handel's patriotic choruses, in which God and King were more or less interchangeable objects of praise. That's an actually really interesting thing to think about when I'm listening to this now after him saying that. I'm hearing King of Kings, Lord of Lords, he shall reign forever. I didn't think about it, but I guess if you're a Brit and you're in the audience, you can relate that to the British Empire in a way. And maybe not, you know, directly, but subliminally you're kind of doing that maybe. So it might have like more of a emotional stir in you in that way. Um, I've never thought about it that way. I've always just learned the Hallelujah Chorus in context of religion, honestly. So never even crossed my mind to think about like an earthly king or kingdom. Not that that's what Handel was doing here, but I'm just saying like, if you link the two together, British Empire with all of this going on at the same time, it's, ah, it's interesting to think about. <laughs> Oh, I forgot about the tradition of standing, too. I forgot where that came from, though. Music, sh music showed it could become the collective voice of nationhood. This, for good and for ill, has been an important function of music ever since. Mm. Handel donated all the earnings from his messiah and most of his considerable estate to an orphanage, the Foundling Hospital. Gestures which give us a clue as to the quality that enriches every note of his music, compassion. One of his final oratorios, Solomon, contains towards its end an aria for the Queen of Sheba. Now she is bidding farewell to her lover, King Solomon, whom she'll never see again as he returns to Jerusalem. The aria, Will the Sun Forget to Streak, is no hysterical outburst of operatic tragedy, nor is it a plaint of sentimental, self-indulgent misery. It's the voice of rueful acceptance, as if the centuries have melted away and left us with a simple, humane message. Time doesn't stand still, so cherish every moment of joy and beauty with gratitude. The Queen of Sheba knew she would never encounter a man of Solomon's wisdom again. It's debatable whether music has ever surpassed the creative ingenuity and spiritual candor of the masterpieces of Bach and Handel either.
I can see how this relates to opera quite a bit, but not quite opera. I think the reason I'm not typically drawn to stuff like this is because the story is being told in just such a highbrow, almost abstract kind of language, in a sense. There's just something about it, though, that I can't connect with. I don't know, maybe some of you feel the same way. Maybe you understand what I'm trying to say, but... In the next programme, the profound moral dimension that Bach and Handel embedded in music gives way to the pleasure principle. In the era of Haydn, Mozart and Beethoven, the composer stopped being a servant and became a kind of god. Hmm. Game on. Okay, well, there we have it. That ends episode two of Howard Goodall's Story of Music. Next time, we're going to get into episode three. So I learned some really good things. I learned what a fugue was, about all of the counterpoint melodies and stuff. I learned the piano was invented around 1700. We learned about the equal... Oh gosh, what was it called? I remember it as modulation equal temperament, I think is what it was. Yeah, so that blew my mind. I had no idea that there was like a, a different note scale back in the day. I learned more about Handel because I didn't know that he wrote opera. I've always known him from like the Messiah and stuff. So that was interesting to me how he moved from opera into writing more like, I guess, church opera. <laughs> And also very interesting, kind of one of those last points about how Handel's music kind of coincided with the rise of the British Empire. So kind of another cool way to think about that. It sounded to me like he was one of the very first composers that had kind of mass appeal to the public. But next week, I'm really looking forward to getting into, I guess it's the Romantic period, maybe, that's coming up. That's what it implied here. So getting into Beethoven and Mozart. I think to my ears, the music becomes a little bit more interesting to listen to in that period. I know uh, Beethoven over here is looking forward to it. I hope you are looking forward to it as well. Make sure you answer my questions or just contribute to the discussion down below in the comment section if you would like. Also, if you enjoyed this video, make sure that you like and subscribe. We're going to get to episode three of this series next week, so make sure you stay tuned for that, and we will see you next time.